12 and Luke chapter 16. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, Lessons from a Lost Soul. Lessons from a Lost Soul. Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 16. Now begin reading with me, please, first of all in Luke 12 and verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And then over to Luke 16, that very familiar passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, betwixt us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And here we have a lesson from a lost soul. Would you bow with me in prayer and ask the Lord to minister to our hearts this morning? Heavenly Father, your word allows us to look into an unseen world, the world of the dead, the world of those that have left this life and have gone to another life. A life where people are dead but yet are living. The Bible says that there is a place called hell for those that are lost and a place called heaven for those that are saved. We know there is no purgatory. We know there is no intermediate state. We know that once we leave this life, we either go into thy presence or we go into hell. And Father, your word reveals that to us, and we're so thankful that we do not have to have any kind of guesswork, but we know. And so, Father, I ask that you will help us to prepare people for death and help us to prepare people for the future. And, Father, the word lost is mentioned in your word many, many times. And we know that there's an anguish of the lost soul. And it is not your desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, Father, those of us that are saved, I ask that you will help us to be vigorous in our witness and in our giving out of the truth and our giving out of the gospel. And if there is anyone here this morning who has never been born again, I pray for their salvation. I pray that the truth of your word will sink down deep into their heart. Now, Father, this morning I ask that we will give attention to the Word of God. And I pray that we will give attention to your Holy Spirit, how frail and weak we are, but how great you are. 
Now speak to every heart this morning. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. I believe in the love of God with all of my heart. I believe in the mercy of God. I believe in the goodness of God. I believe in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that it is not his will for any man or woman, boy or girl, in this building this morning to be lost, but to be saved. It has never been God's desire to send anyone to hell. God is a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of grace. You see that all through the Bible. You see that in the book of Genesis. And uh, God's dealing with the antediluvian age. And you see the warnings that God gave. And uh, he said uh, in Genesis, My spirit will not always strive with man, yet I'll give him 120 years to repent. And after 120 years, man did not repent. And the rains came. And the floods came, and the Bible said that the earth and every living thing upon it was destroyed except those that were in the ark. Mercy, yes, but also judgment after a period of time of warning to lost mankind. Uh, you see the same thing in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, if I can find ten righteous men in the city, I will not destroy it. God could not find, Abraham could not find ten righteous men. And because of that, the city was destroyed. You see the love of God, the mercy of God, but you see the judgment of God. If you'll read the book of Daniel, you'll discover that God has placed upon the children of Israel 70 weeks. And he said, I'm going to deal with you within that framework of 70 weeks weeks. At the end of 69 weeks, Messiah is going to be cut off, which will leave one week, a set of seven years left that God is going to judge Israel. But between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel, fixed right there is the church age, the age of grace, the age that you and I are living in right now. It has been going on since Jesus went back to heaven. When Jesus went back to heaven, the people were told, this same Jesus that you see that is going away will one day come again. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour when the Son of Man comes. And so for 2,000 years now, we've been waiting for the second coming. God has been calling out a church. He told the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what's been happening. But one day... One day, we're going to see the age of grace come to a conclusion. And then the seven years tribulation will come upon this earth and God's judgment will fall upon this earth just as sure as you and I are sitting in this building this morning. God's judgment is going to come upon sinful men just as sure as you and I are sitting in this building this morning. And the Old Testament said this, Lord, in wrath, Remember mercy. The same thing takes place in the tribulation period. Right in the very midst of the most severe judgment that has ever been seen upon the earth, God will, in the midst of wrath, remember mercy, and there will be hundreds of people saved during the tribulation period. I said all of that to say this. God's a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness and judgment. He will save those that come to him, but those who turn against him and blatantly reject him, they will be lost forever and forever and forever and forever. We Christians sometimes seem to feel like that we must apologize for the judgment of God. The devil's crowd, the atheist, the humanist, they like to go back to the Old Testament and they like to say, well, the God of the Old Testament was a bully. Look at his judgment upon nations. Look at his judgment upon men, women, and children. Look at all of that. But yet you study it very carefully, you will see that those nations had ample time to repent. They had the word of God given to them very clearly through the nation of Israel. Those that could repent and would repent uh, did so. But those who turned directly against God, God judged them. There is no need for you and I to apologize for the judgment of God. 
Let me say again. There is no need for you and I to apologize for hell. There is no need for you and I to apologize for hell. My Bible tells me there is a hell. My Bible speaks more of hell than it does heaven. My Bible gives me more of a clear picture of what hell and the lake of fire is going to be like than it does what heaven is going to be like. Jesus warned again and again and again about a place called hell. Now the question might come to you, why is there a hell? Well, the Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It is never God's intentions for man to occupy hell. But man did something on his own. Man said, I will not have God as my ruler. I will not have Jesus as my Savior. Psalm 14 says, The fool, the simpleton, has said in his heart, No God. No God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 tells us that God has looked at mankind, those that are sinful and lost, and has appraised them that they are lost and that they, listen to this, have no appetite for the things of God. That's seen very clearly uh, in the people that we associate with today who are lost. They have no appetite. Ask them to come to church and see what they say. Ask them to read the Bible. They have no appetite for the things of God. They have no appetite for God himself. Now, here's a question. What is God to do with those who spit in the face of his love? What is God to do with those who turn their back blatantly upon his grace? Is he going to allow them into heaven? Is he going to allow them into his presence? The Bible says there can be no sin in the presence of God. That's the only reason you and I will be in his presence is because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed us from our sin. So what do you do with, if you'll permit me, what will God do with the refuge of the world, the God-haters, the God-rejecters, who blatantly, willingly turn their back on God and his love? If you'll go back to chapter 12, please, and look at how Jesus begins to describe this rich man. In chapter 12, and look at verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain uh, rich man brought forth plentiful. That is, his ground was fertile. The ground that he owned yielded great fruit. But verse 17 says, And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Notice the personal pronoun I mentioned over and over and over again. You see, that's man's big problem. Pride, selfishness, I. I will be the master of my own fate. I will control my own life. I will do as I please. God will not tell me how to live. One of our men who's a fine witness, uh, was at a certain business establishment witnessing. And one of the ladies in that business establishment, he asked her to come to church. She said, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to have a preacher or anybody else tell me how to live. See, that's what you find with lost humanity. I refuse to bow myself before God. I refuse to humble myself. I refuse to repent. Now, Look at verse 17. And he thought within himself. The word thought there is a very strong word. It literally means to thoroughly to be cast in the mind. In other words, this thought is cast in his mind and nothing is going to change him. He is thoroughly committed to this way of living. He is thoroughly committed to this way of thinking and this way of living. I will do as I please. No God will tell me how to live. Now think for just a second. Who made him rich? Who allowed him to be rich, if you will? 
Is it not God that allowed his land to bring forth? Was it not God that gave him the air to breathe? But he disregarded all of that and said, absolutely not, I will be in control. All right, question. What is God to do with those people? He can't allow them into heaven. There's only one place for them, and they make the choice themselves. Why is there a hell? Because there has to be a place where God can confine the wicked, the vile, those who have had their mind set on their own way of living and disregarded God altogether. Would he have saved them if they would have come to him? Absolutely. Would he have given them everlasting life? Absolutely. But they chose to turn against him. And so a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels became a place where man also who rejects God would spend eternity forever and forever and forever and forever. You and I should never apologize for the judgment of God. You and I should never apologize because there is a place called hell. Why? First of all, because God hates sin. God hates it. You see that all the way through your, your Bible. Now, how did God strike out against sin? By destroying the sinner? No. By giving his only son that sinners might be saints. Now, you think about that for a second. God did not strike out at the sinner because of his hatred for sin, but he took his own son and said, you, my son, God in the flesh, you take all of man's sin up on you. That's the way I'll deal with sin. And what does man do? What does the majority of men do? Disregard that. And say to themselves, no, I will do as I please. Never forget that God hates sin. And it is God's desire that you and I as his people come to a place one day where there is no sin and where we can experience a life free of sin. What a great thought that is for the child of God. What a great thought that is for the Christian. Never apologize for God's judgment. He hates sin. He hates it. He wants to get sin to the point where it is no more, and he will one day. But yet there is a place call hell for those who turn against God. Now, personally, I believe the man in Luke 12 is the same man that you see in Luke chapter 16. And if you'll begin to study what Jesus said about the, this man, I'll have my way, I'll do as I choose. But he discovered that eventually God will have his way. God will allow you and his sovereignty to go so far, but you can only go so far, and then the end comes. Now look at what I believe are some lessons that you and I can learn from this lost soul. Number one, what may seem good outwardly, listen carefully, what may seem good outwardly may be utterly corrupt in the sight of God. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. The word sumptuously there is splendor. This man lived in splendor Every day. There was nothing that he desired that was kept from him. He fared sumptuously every day. You go back to chapter 12 and notice what's said about him. Look at what I have. I don't have enough room to take care of all of my goods and all of my riches. What am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my old barns. I'll build greater. 
And I'll say to my soul, enjoy yourself, eat, drink, and be merry, live it up, and live in splendor. If you had lived in that day, would you have envied him? If you had lived in that day, would you have wanted his lifestyle? Now hold it a second. There's nothing wrong with being rich within itself. Look at verse 25. But Abraham said, son, talking to this other rich man, remember, Abraham was a rich man. As a matter of fact, Abraham was probably richer in world's goods than this man was. But Abraham is in a place of splendor and glory. Abraham did not allow his riches to turn him away from the holy God. Abraham realized that God was the source of all riches. And so Abraham did not covet this kind of a lifestyle, but this rich man did. And so what may appear outwardly to be beneficial, uh, to be good, to be wonderful, is really corrupt in the sight of God. Now let's bring that down to where we live today. Have you ever turned on a sporting event and you see how this guy's going to get $17 million for four years? And you say to yourself, boy, I wish I was him. Really? What would those riches do for you? Would they corrupt you or would you remain like Abraham? Better be very, very careful because what this world may deem to be very important in God's sight might not be worth a thing. Just remember something. What the world seems to be very important, Christians are going to walk on in heaven. You ever thought about that? What the world seems to be of great value, you and I as Christians, we're just going to step on it. That's all it's going to be worth in heaven. We're just going to step on it. Good to look at, but we'll just walk on by and pass on to something else. Be very careful with what you're living for because what the world may live for and deem to be very important may corrupt in the sight of God. Look at the second thing. What we may consider helpless and worthless, listen now, what we may consider to be helpless and worthless yet in the sight of God, may be of great value. Look at verse 20 through verse 22. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now hold it for a second. The word desiring there is eager. Here is a very poor man. Watch this now. He is eager just to get some crumbs. Now go back to the rich man. What's he after? Splendor, riches, glory. That's what he's desiring. But here's this poor beggar, and he's eager just for some crumbs. What if you had walked by, if you'd been living in the day, that day, and you'd have walked by? Here's the palace. Here's the palace grounds. Oh, and by the way, these crumbs were not thrown out there by the rich man intentionally. Did you know that? The idea here from the passage of Scripture is they accidentally fell out. Maybe as the servants were taking out the garbage, some crumbs accidentally fell out and this poor beggar is eager just to get the crumbs. Now, you walked by at that time, if you did, and you looked at the palace and the grounds and the splendor and all of it, and you looked at the rich man, who would you want to be? Who would you think is more important, the rich man or this poor beggar? I'll guarantee you the world we live in would say, oh, the rich man. I'd much rather be that rich man faring sumptuously every day. I sure don't want to be that beggar eagerly waiting 
for crumbs. When I went to the Philippines a few years ago, Brother Paul Vineyard picked me up at the airport. First thing we did was go out to eat. When two or three Baptists get together, you eat. And so we went out to eat, and after we uh, had a meal, he drove me up to the most elaborate home that I think I've ever seen in my life, and that was in the Philippines. Now, if you've never been to Manila, and you, and you need to go to Manila, 12, over 12 million people, and, and I'm, I apologize, but I saw some of the worst filth I've ever seen in my life in Manila. And the river that runs right through the middle of Manila is filthy, stench everywhere. And then right beside of it is high-rise apartments and uh, skyscrapers. And they've got all of that there. Well, I didn't know what Paul was doing. See, I thought he was taking me to his house, but I didn't know Paul was a trickster. And this was a mansion, and there were uh, a high fence all around it and palm trees, and it was the most beautiful place I think I'd ever seen. And I thought to myself, a missionary's living in this? And he pulled up to the gate, and he said, well, Brother Boofer, here we are. Here's what your missions dollars are doing. <laughs> and then he laughed, and he said, no. He said, this is one of the most wealthy men in the Philippines. He owns this. And then we drove down the street to his place, which was not bad, but on the way from that palace to Brother Vineyard's home, there were little children running alongside the street asking us to give them some food. Here's this big palace. Here's these little children running alongside of us asking us for food. And when I saw that, I thought about this situation right here. What looks like to man is so important to God doesn't mean a thing. We get things mixed up, don't we? Read on, if you will. Verse 21, And desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Hmm. The beggar died. That's it. End of story. He didn't have anything on the earth. He eagerly awaited some crumbs. Now he's dead. Who cares? I said uh, in my last message a few Wednesdays ago on this, or Sundays ago on this, that probably what happened to this man, he was a beggar, so probably what happened to him as they took him outside of Jerusalem to the Valley of Gehenna. The Valley of Gehenna was the garbage dump where they threw their garbage where they threw dead animals, and if a beggar who didn't have any money, that's where they threw him. So they probably picked up this beggar, put him in a sack, no sermon, no funeral procession, no nothing, took him out to the valley of Gehenna and tossed him down and walked away. The rich man dies. What happens to him? probably one of the most elaborate funerals you could have ever imagined. End of story. No. No, that's not the end of the story. Look at it. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now what's really important? Now what's really important? Did the riches of this man do him any good now? No. See, what we're trying to get at this morning is lessons we can learn from a lost soul. In this life, you may have everything, but that won't get you into heaven. Being rich doesn't send you to hell, but it's a matter of where your heart is. 
It's a matter of what you've got your mind set on and your life set up on. Put down a third thought, if you will. Lessons from a lost soul. In verse 24, wealth and possessions and fame will not be rewarded in eternity. Wealth, possessions, and fame will not be rewarded in eternity. Look at verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So what? He had a palace. Probably his brothers were fighting over who owned it. His kinfolk were fighting over what they were going to get. What good is it going to do him now? What good is his wealth going to do him now? Now he faces a holy God who doesn't care about what house you lived in or what circles you ran with. I'm amazed the way we think sometimes. You, you've heard the rumor about Hanoi Jane being saved? I hope she is. But people keep making some kind of a statement like this. Boy, wouldn't it be great if she was saved? Look at what she could do with her money. God doesn't need her money. Where do we ever get the idea that we need the world's money? Where do we ever get the idea that we think the world's we need the world's fame. <coughs> now, I am not and have never been, and don't get mad at me, an Elvis fan, okay? But I was, and watched the basketball game last night, and after the basketball game was on, I, some, a program caught my eye, and it was entitled Elvis and His Religious Music or Gospel Roots. And I watched it. And I listened to men talk about Elvis Presley. Here's what they said. He wanted to insert a gospel song into his performance. And they didn't want him to do it, but he wanted to do that. But he wouldn't sing some of the songs. He would have the Jordanaires to sing it. And he would say, I want you to listen to them sing. I don't sing with them. And they sang, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Then they went on to say how that after he would have a performance, that he would have dignitaries and friends come up to his motel room, and he would have his group to go up and sing till 2, 3, 4 in the morning, for those people, but most of the songs, 90% of the songs would be gospel songs. I watched all that. And you know what I thought? My opinion. Here's a simple country boy, probably a good simple country boy, very talented. A lot of talent. Maybe saved, I don't know. I hope he is. I don't wish anybody to be in hell. But got caught up in a fast-paced lifestyle. Got caught up in the drugs, got caught up in the money, and he couldn't let it go. But still remembered his roots and what he heard when he was a boy. But the question came to me was this. Is any of his money doing him any good now? Is any of his fame doing him any good now? No. Just like this rich man. All of his fame, all of his wealth is not remembered in eternity. But what about the beggar? What is said of the beggar? Verse 25, And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now. You might want to circle those two words in your Bible, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Put down number four. 
the pursuit of transparent things and the neglect of eternal things will haunt those in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Verse 25 again. The pursuit of temporal things and the neglect of eternal things will haunt those in hell forever and forever and forever. Notice the phrase, son, remember. Now, I'm not going to get into the uh, theological aspect of all of this other to say, remember now, this is Old Testament time. This is before the resurrection of Jesus. And remember that everyone that died in Old Testament time went to the same place. Lazarus, bosom being the paradise side and hell being the torment side. Notice here it says they can see one another. They know where one another are, but they cannot pass from one another. But then remember when Jesus was, resurrected, was dead and in the grave, he, Ephesians 4 says that he that ascended is he that first descended into the lower parts of the earth and took and led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. What happened was is Jesus took the saved. By the way, if a Jehovah's Witness ever comes to your door and says to you, Jesus went to hell, Jesus went to Hades, place of the departed spirits in the Old Testament, saved on one side, unsaved on the other. Jesus went to the paradise side of Hades, took those that were saved with him to heaven. That's why Paul says now, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Keep in mind of something else too. Hell now and the lake of fire in the future are two different places. Right now, everybody that's in hell suffers the same. But remember, there's going to be a great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. And the Bible says those that are in hell will be taken out and judged according to their works and then will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. Now, the lake of fire will be forever and forever and forever. Where will it be? Possibly in the center of the new earth, like hell is in the center of this earth, according to the Bible. Everyone suffers the same in hell now, but they'll be taken out at the great white throne judgment, judged according to their works, and then cast into the lake of fire where, listen, everyone then will have their just reward. Those that rejected the most light will suffer the most. And quite possibly, a man or a woman who grew up in the South that has heard the gospel every day, almost every day of their life and said no, will be the one that will suffer the more severe punishment rather than those that have not had the opportunity like they have to hear the gospel. In our church back in Tennessee, from a boy, I remember two men. And they would come to church often, but both of them were lost and they would get up and walk out the door. And sometimes our preacher would preach so powerfully and I would think to myself, how could a man sit here and hear that kind of preaching and reject the gospel. And yet they'd get up and they would walk out. One man in particular who lived just right down from the church, my first pastor I ever remember was G.N. Francis. I've told you about it. He would go to his house again and again and again. Arthur Estes came, same thing. And on and on, every pastor we had would go to this man's house He'd keep saying no. He'd keep coming to church, but he'd keep saying no. And then I became pastor. And I hadn't been pastor there very long. And on a Sunday night, a warm August Sunday night, I looked on the left-hand side on the church, and here come this man riding on a horse. Now, he'd been in church that morning. Here he came riding on a horse, right out in front of the building, up this way, up by John Rector's house, up by Perry Rector's house, and on over. 
and I was preaching and I thought in my mind, will he ever get saved? He'd been there that morning and that night. We dismissed church and we were all out in front. He came back down riding. We waved at him and he went on over. And the next morning his wife called and said, Preacher, he's dead. Will you have the funeral? Now here I am standing on Wednesday morning in the front of that same pulpit I stood behind on Sunday night. That same pulpit that that man had sat in front of for years and had heard different preachers from that same pulpit say, you need to prepare for death. And he didn't do it. I couldn't say to his boys, you'll see him again. I couldn't say that. I couldn't say to his wife, you'll see. I couldn't say that. Because why? He lived for the temporal things of this life and rejected the eternal things. Number five, there will be no answers to prayer in hell. Verse 24, verse 27, and 28. There will be no answers to prayer in hell. Look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that they may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, if you won't believe the preaching of the word of God, then you won't be saved. Some, some people have the idea, well, if I could just see a miracle, if God would just do something miraculous, he has. He sent his son to die for you. Here's the eternal word of God. He has. Let me put it this way. If you won't be saved at the preaching of God's word, if Jesus walked in that door in person this morning and turned and looked at you, you wouldn't believe that either. You know why? Because you're dead in trespasses and sins. No, a man is saved by hearing the word of God and the spirit of God drawing him to the Son of God. And then lastly... Those who are lost when they die are eternally lost. Those who are lost when they die are eternally lost. There's no purgatory. You can't pay them out of hell. You can't light a candle and pay a priest. You say, Brother Boofer, that's, that's pretty hard. Well, I've got to preach the truth and I'm without apology. Excuse me. It's not my, my desire to hurt anybody, but I am going to preach the truth whether you like it or not. Amen. That's the scripture. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. It's not going to be very long until on Sunday evening we're going to be preaching through the book of Revelation again. Not be a verse by verse, but will be an overview, a bird's eye view of the book of Revelation. And I, I hope that you'll pray with us uh, about that. Now, Revelation 14, look at verse 10 and 11. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And in one more verse, chapter 22, verse 11. Chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 11. <clears throat> he that is unjust, or literally offensive, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, literally soiled, he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. See, that's it. That's it. If you're lost, you're lost forever. If you're saved, you're saved forever. That's God's word. Now, here are the lessons from a lost soul. Here are lessons from a man that lived and died and didn't listen to God's word. 
Now, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? If you're here this morning and you've never been saved by God's grace, would you let our soul winners take the word of God this morning and show you how you can be saved and know it? Don't walk out of here lost this morning. And then we that are saved, what are we doing to tell the lost? Are we faithful in our giving of the gospel to our friends? Are we faithful in giving so that the gospel will be preached beginning right here and literally throughout the world? What are we going to do? With Most of you have heard of the name of Spurgeon and you have read some of his sermons, I know, revered as the prince of preachers. And I try to read something from him every day. And uh, someone had mentioned to him about how God was mightily using him. And uh, he said, it's nothing that I do. He said, I'd like to show you something. And he took the man in question down below his pulpit, down under his pulpit, downstairs. And he said, every time I preach, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, or whenever I'm preaching, I have at least three to 400 of my members down below praying for me. And I read that again and again. I've heard that for years. And I read that again and again. And I thought, just to know that God's people is praying for you. Uh, it's not easy to preach. Uh, you may think after 35 or 36 years of doing it, it becomes easy. Well, you always battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan hates the preaching of the Word of God. Old-timey folks used to call uh, the pulpit the sacred desk. Well, there's nothing sacred about this wood here, nothing sacred about it at all, but there is about what's being said from it, and um, it's important. And uh, we, we have a lot of fun, and we do a lot of cutting up, but when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God, we get serious. And I've said all of that to say this. I'd like to know that you're praying for me. And I believe many of you are, and I covet your prayers as we look into the Word of God. We're at Psalm 104 tonight as we continue preaching through the book of Psalms. Tonight, out of one, Psalm 104, the theme, the majesty of God in creation. The majesty of God in creation. Psalm 104, beginning in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. Who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Who maketh the clouds his chariot. Who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Who maketh his angels spirits. His ministers a flaming fire who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hastened away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys into the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they may turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted, where the birds make their nest for the stork. The fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats, and the rocks uh, for the coonies. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. 
The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beast. There go the ships. There is that levitation which thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season, that thou mayest give them uh, they, they gather. Thou openest thine hands, and they are filled with good. Thou handest thy face, and they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and he trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer and ask the Lord to speak to our heart as we look into his word uh, this evening. Heavenly Father, we again acknowledge your presence in this service tonight. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this great passage of Scripture. And we thank you for all of the truth that it contains. And as we look into it, we get a little bit of an idea of the things that you do behind the scenes, the things that we don't